Having got a taste of linear regression, let us delve a little bit deeper. You might recall from the previous lecture that essentially this is what simple linear regression is doing. You've got two attributes of a data set, in this case rooms and price, and we've got some observations. Each dot represents a particular home, and we're just trying to plot the best linear representation of that, the best line that crosses through all the points. And we know from the previous discussion as well that for each line, we have the actual value and the predicted value by the line. And the distance between the point and the line represents the residue for that point. Some call it the error, some call it the residual. Let's just call it the residue. Okay. So this is how much off the model prediction is from the real value. So for every point, you can plot that. And you will recall that linear regression essentially uses the least squares criterion. That is, it selects the line that minimizes the sum of the squared residuals. That's what it's really doing. If you run linear regression in R, this is the kind of output you get. And uh, for now, let's focus on the coefficients. Now remember, in the linear regression model, we said the target attribute price is represented as beta 0 plus beta 1 times the number of rooms, which is the predictor attribute, plus a residual value. Okay, so this is the actual target attribute and therefore the residual is also included here, right? Uh, so this is what it is. And essentially what you want to do in linear regression is to find the values of these coefficients, beta 0 and beta 1. Once you find their values, you can plug them in to the regression equation and that becomes your regression model. Okay, so here we run it and then of course you'll see in the hands-on lab how to do this. So we get the coefficient intercept, which is nothing but beta zero, and you get the coefficient RM, which is the coefficient for the number of rooms. And those are the values, so you plug it in. So in this case, the regression equation really says price equals minus 34 plus, minus 34 being beta zero, plus 9.102, which is beta one, times Rm, or the number of rooms, okay? So if you're given a new home with, let's say, five rooms, then the price you will predict for that home is minus 34.671 plus five times 9.102, or 9.102 times five, because five is the number of rooms, 9.102 is beta one, this is beta zero, so that is what you will use for predicting it. Okay, so this is essentially how linear regression works. And therefore, we have the two coefficients, beta zero, beta one. Therefore, the regression equation, as I've already pointed out, is uh, the median value. In this example, we are looking at the Boston housing data set. And therefore, the target attribute is median value. And the predictor attribute is Rm number of rooms and therefore in this case the regression equation is uh, median value equals minus 34.671 plus 9.102 times rm okay so that's really what you get here okay now let's go a little bit deeper now let's say you're given a data set of, of a number of uh, houses or households and you know that the uh, average value of the house is 250,000 and you're not given any other information. Okay, so in the absence of any further information, what is your best prediction for the value of a random house? Right, so somebody just shows a new house, says, what would you predict as the price for this house in this particular neighborhood? The only information you know is that the average is 250,000. So with that information, you can do no better than predict that the price for this home is also going to be 250,000. There's really nothing better you can do. You're not given any further information. Okay, so that actually points uh, boils down to this. This is the price and this is, let's say, the number of rooms. We are still considering one predictor attribute, number of rooms. And the median value we know, the, the average price is y bar. Okay, 
and the actual value is here. But you're not told when you're told about the new home, you're not told about the number of rooms. So the best you can do is predict the average, which is Y bar or price bar, if you like, as the price, predicted price. But then that would be off. The actual price is YI or price I, if you like. That's the actual price. And therefore, the difference between the actual price and the predicted price is so much. That's the residual, or you might call it the error. Okay, so without the regression results, our best prediction is simply the average. And therefore, the error or the residual would be yi minus y bar, yi minus y bar. Or you might call, want to call it y bar minus yi. Uh, it really is not going to matter because later on we'll square this value and therefore it doesn't matter which uh, order you put those attributes in. Okay. Now, with the regression, you have the regression. So with the regression, we can reduce the error from yi minus y bar to yi minus y hat hat is usually used as the symbol for the predicted value. So the predicted value is this. For this particular household, if you had the regression model in place, the line, then the predicted value is this, actual value is this, okay? So therefore, earlier the error was yi minus y bar, that is the distance from here to the line, but now the error is only yi minus y hat, the distance from the error to the regression line. Okay, and therefore we reduce the error, improved our prediction performance by y hat minus y bar. Okay, so this is the new residual, which is much less than the old residual. So this is the benefit that the regression model gave us. Okay, um, so again, so the pro proportion of the total deviation, so therefore. The total deviation without the regression was yi minus y, ha, y bar mean and with the regression the deviation is only y hat minus y bar and therefore the, deep, the portion of the total deviation that the regression explained is y hat minus y bar which is this much. What do you mean by regression explaining it? Okay, now think about it this way. You said, well, I've got this home and the best value I could predict without being told anything additional other than the average was 250,000. But now you told me that this home has two rooms and therefore I understand that its price is going to be a little less than average because the number of rooms is also less than average. Okay, so you say, oh, now I understand why it's below average. Earlier, we were not given this additional information about rooms and therefore we could not say why it's less than average. Now we say, oh, I understand it's lower because the number of rooms is lower. That's what we mean by the regression explaining the deviation from the average value. Okay, so this is what we mean by proportion or portion of the total deviation explained by regression, not proportion. So y hat minus y, y bar is the amount of deviation from the mean that the regression accounts for or explains. And the rest of it is what the regression is unable to explain. Right? That is, we are saying, okay, if the number of rooms is a good predictor, then we understand that the uh, value should be here. But why is it here? That is unexplained. The regression is not able to explain that, right? It's a residual because it's not able to explain. That's the residual. That's the unexplained residual. Now, usually people don't call it error because it is possible that by adding additional predictor attributes, you could reduce that residual, okay? So they just call it residual because it's, there is a predicted value and then there is the actual value. The difference is the residual, right? 
and also using the word residual rather than error signifies the fact that well we are using a linear regression we are not saying that it's really truly linear we're just using it because it works well it's a good approximation right and therefore we just say it's the residue not the error okay so now there are three values that we can calculate one is called the total sum of squares okay now till now we were considering just a single point now we uh, escalate all of that to the whole data set we now have n points based on which we are building the regression model and therefore for every point the uh, total deviation from that point to the mean is yi minus y hat the whole square right so for every point we are calculating the distance from the mean to that point and then we are squaring that value and then we are adding up that value across all the points right that is why it's sigma i equals 1 to n yi minus y bar the whole square okay so that is the that is what is called as the total sum of squares that is before we had the regression available the best prediction we would have made for each of them is uh, the is y bar okay and therefore the total sum of squares or the total squared errors would have been this yi minus y bar the whole square and sigma that from i equals 1 to n okay so now once you have the regression we know that the uh, residual or the error is now y hat minus y bar okay that is the residual from the regression line to the mean okay so this is what is called sum of squares regression and finally even after the regression there is still some leftover residual which is yi minus y hat which is the distance from the point to the regression line so this is what is called sum of squared errors okay and it so happens that tss is always equals to equal to ssr plus sse okay the important characteristic here is this thing called r squared ssr divided by tss sum of squares regression remember is the portion of the error that uh, the regression explains the portion of the deviation from the mean that the regression explains and tss is the total sum of square which is without the regression all the error we had so r square is simply the proportion of deviation from the mean that the regression is able to explain and clearly we would like high values of r square if r square is 1 then every point falls on the regression line okay so that's uh, an important notion here okay and in the case of simple linear regression r square uh, just turns out to be the square of the correlation coefficient between those two attributes okay so now we have the sum of square errors which is uh, i equal to 1 to 1 yi minus y hat the whole square that is given the regression line available we saw that there was still some deviation from the regression line right and we sum up all of that that is sse but that was across n points so for a single case on the average the error is going to be sse divided by m because there are n cases okay and in regression we calculate this thing called root mean squared error or rmse and that is the square root of this expression and therefore rmse is square root of sse divided by n and in this course we'll be using rms error or rmse as our main criterion to decide on the quality of a regression model okay some caveats when we use regression first of all estimates are not same as the true values in other words when you estimate a value based on a regression model that is just an estimate we should not get fooled into thinking the model is exact and therefore that is the real value 
we always have to pay attention to the fact that it's just an estimate based on a simplified assumption that things are linear. And another very important point, and sometimes we tend to forget this, is we should not extrapolate outside the range of the data. In other words, if we built a regression model and the minimum and maximum of the predictor attributes was something, then we ideally should not use the regression model if we have predictors which are outside of the range on which the model was built. That would obviously be quite misleading. And don't use linear regression when the data are obviously nonlinear. Right? Sometimes when you look at the scatter plot, you'll see that the scatter plot exhibits a nice neat curve. Right? In that case, a linear regression model will not give good results and it might not be a wise thing to do to use it. Finally, as we already discussed, residuals are not the same as errors. Okay, so some assumptions of linear regression. Now, in our case, because we're going to be dealing with large amounts of data, uh, these things that I'm going to discuss now are not all that important, but I'll just discuss them anyway. Now, one of the assumptions that linear regression makes is that the residuals are normally distributed for every single value of the predictor attribute, right? In other words, what I've done here is I'm showing the plot of the residuals for each value of the number of rooms. And I'm saying that the residuals should be normally distributed for each value, right? If the residuals are very large for some values and very small for other values, then linear regression may not be very appropriate. Okay, and another assumption also is that the variance of each of these normal distributions is actually the same. Another important point is when you compare the fitted values, which is what the model predicts, with the residuals that we obtained for each one, then the plot should look like something like this. Right? In other words, there should be no discernible pattern between the fitted values and the residual values. In this example, you see a pattern, right? For low values of fitted values, the residuals are very close, they are very small, and the value of the residual keeps on increasing as we see higher and higher fitted values. And this, in statisticians, refer to this as heteroscedasticity. Okay? Now, in this case, the residuals appear to form some kind of a, a curve as when plotted against the fitted values. And this is a nonlinear residual situation. So these two cases, one would say that the linear model is not a great fit. Okay, But all of these apply to more you know, social science research when they build a model and they want to say that the model is a valid theory of the underlying situation. But in data analytics, that's not what we are trying to do. What we are trying to do is to build a model that gives us good predictions. So therefore, even if some of these things are present, if our model is giving us good predictions, a low RMS error, then we might still go ahead and use these models. Okay. So the assumptions, linear regression assumptions, error terms are independent and represent a random sample, possible values for any XI. That is sort of what we saw in that graph earlier. For any given XI, there can be many values of epsilon uh, which is the residual, and these are all normally distributed. And epsilon values, the residual values, have equal variance for all x values. Okay. Now, typically in R, when you build a, a linear regression model and say plot the model, it will show you these four graphs. Okay. This is the residual versus fitted plot that we discussed earlier. In this case, you see a slight trend. Okay, but it's not too deep a trend, so you, you might say it's all right. Okay, and then there are other plots. Okay, the two things I would look at are residual versus fitted and the normal QQ plot. Ideally, the normal QQ plot should fall on this straight line. Okay, it should fall on a straight line. This one is approximately okay. Okay, now in the residuals versus leverage plot, you see some of these values here. This is the 300. 
uh, you know, the, these are the case number within the data set. What it's showing you is that these are outliers. Okay. Sometimes what we might do is plot a linear model, look at the cases that are outliers, eliminate those cases which are outliers, and rebuild a new model. Okay. We could also do that. In fact, one of our uh, later labs will show you how to do that. Okay. But of course, you can also plot the fitted versus residuals like this. You don't need to because the actual plot in R will show you that anyway. Okay, so some of the things we could do, as I just pointed out, is you could drop the outliers, examine the plots to identify the outliers, drop the outliers and redo the model. Sometimes when you find that there is some trend in uh, the fitted versus residuals and some of these other charts, you may transform the attributes and plot uh, and do the linear model over, over again. Okay, so for example, you might say, instead of using the attribute as it is, you might use the log of the attribute. Okay, or you might raise the attribute to some power and then try to plot the linear regression for the power of that value. Okay, uh, or if even if that doesn't work, then you may have to redo the regression with different predictors. You may have to gather more data, use different predictors, whatever it is. Now, multiple linear regression has all of the characteristics we just spoke about. Only thing is, instead of one predictor attribute, you've got many predictor attributes. That's it. Otherwise, we are doing exactly the same thing, following the least squares criterion, everything. But in the, this case, instead of plotting the least squares line, you're actually plotting the least squares plane in multiple linear regression.